to this afternoon session. Um, of course, uh, we're grateful for all of you to have made the effort to join us this afternoon. Today's event is a joint session between the Mona School of Business and Management and the Academy of International Business, Latin America and the Caribbean region. For the Mona School of Business and Management, the session is being hosted as part of our Brown Bag Research Series. And for the Academy of International Business, AIB LAC, this session is one of its outstanding talk series. So without further ado, in the way of an introduction, I am Indiana Minto Koi. I am an academic director for the MSc programs and senior lecturer here at the Mona School of Business and Management. I'm also the Caribbean Countries Director for AIB LAC. And so a special welcome to you or AIB community or friends and colleagues who've joined us from um, a number of countries. Uh, my colleagues here who are based at the Mona School of Business and Management, a warm welcome. And, and I dare say for those who are not here, a very tropical welcome to you. Um, we have our audience, of course, on Facebook. And so a special welcome to you. We are not forgetting you either. Thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, and so um, as we go through for this very, very special session this afternoon, a conversation with Professor David Story, I want to first invite you, please feel free to send your questions, your comments in the chat as we go through. Um, we also have persons manning Facebook, so please feel free to send your questions or comments there as well. Before we get going any further, I want to invite um, our executive director for the Mona School of Business and Management, Dr. David McBean, uh, just to give a few words of welcome to you before we, we get going into the session. Dr. McBean. Thank you, Indiana, and good afternoon all, and especially a warm welcome to you Professor Story. Uh, hopefully when COVID-19 is over, we can get you here in person so you can enjoy <laughs> some warm weather. I've, I've shared a few British winters in my life. So I, you, you, have, my <laughs> you have my sympathies. Um, but we are pleased and honored to have you. Um, your work is well known and um, speaks for itself. And so, you know, as part of our outreach to meet other faculty, other business schools, um, industry, we're, we're pleased to have another of these engagements. Also for other AIB colleagues uh, from around Latin America and elsewhere, welcome to this presentation. And uh, we look forward with great interest to the topics that we'll discuss here today. So thank you once again, Professor Story. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And we look forward to other engagements with you in the future. Thank you again and welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Matt Bean. Um, and so I see a, a number of, of colleagues that um, Professor Story has worked with, that we've worked with. Um, and, and that before, you know, I, I just want to mark um, this moment with a thank you to Professor Story for agreeing to this session. You know, when I, I reached out um, in the, the, the role of the chair for the MSBM Research Committee, and I thought to myself, um, what, what could we benefit from as a school, as a region, and also the AIB LAC community at a time like this? And so I figured um, this would have been, and I, I, as it will turn out, I, I think an excellent session. And so without further ado, Professor Story, um, I'm going to introduce you. Now, when I mentioned that I would be doing this introduction, the first comment that I got was make it short. Um, and I did, I confess Prof Story, I did do my best, I think, 
to, to, to make it short. Um, but I also feel that it's important for the audience, um, many of whom may not know you, to get a sense of your background, your history, and even to use that as a way of framing their thinking and the questions that they may want to ask as we go through. So of course, Professor Story is one of my um, co-authors, my colleagues. Um, I, I went through when I thought, okay, what can I ignore from this bio? So let me go. Professor David Story is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Business and Management, sorry, Business Management and Economics at the University of Sussex in the UK. Now he has a wealth of experience as an academic at a number of universities in the UK and beyond. David's research has had considerable uh, scholarly impact as recognized by his citation count in Google Scholar, which I checked just before coming on stands at 31,448. In fact, um, Landstrom and Hariki noted his book, um, and that's Understanding the Small Business Sector, as being in eighth place based on entrepreneurship journal citations. And in 2020, Baker et al.'s bibliometric overview of small business economics reported David's book as the second most frequently cited work in the journal in a 20 year period. David has numerous publications, over 130, in some of the top journals um, in the world. Beyond the citations, of course, he's received a number of awards and appointments. Um, these include the 1998 International Award for Entrepreneurship and Small Business Research from the Swedish Council, the Wilford White Fellowship from the International Council for Small Business. And of course, he was invited to serve as a fellow of the Institute of Small Business and Entrepreneurship. David's research has seen him serve in his country um, in a number of roles, including as member of the UK Small Business Council. He's also consulted for many governments internationally, including um, the governments of Australia, Mexico, New Zealand, Denmark, and Sweden. Um, he's also co collaborated with the World Bank in producing an enterprise plan for Malaysia in producing the 2007 Handbook on SME Policy Evaluation for the OECD. And he's also contributed to the OECD's work for the G20 and worked with the IBRC on enterprise in the Middle East and North Africa region. In Europe, he's also coordinated an EU-wide review of new technology-based firms for the European Commission and in 2016, worked on the project Startup Support for Young People in the EU from implementation to evaluation. Now, David has reduced his activities significantly. Um, and with this reduced workload, he is currently assisting the OECD in updating the OECD SME and Entrepreneurship Policy Evaluation Handbook and also in reviewing changes in job quality amongst the self-employed in the EU. He's a special advisor to the House of Commons Business Energy and Industrial Strategic and Committee inquiry into post-pandemic economic recovery. Now, of all this illustrious um, uh, set of accomplishments, um, I reserve the best for last, I think, and that is that um, Professor Story has worked as an advisor to the Inter-American Development Bank on microenterprises in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. And he's also done work for the IFC on Mexico. Now, this is a mouthful, David. Um, this is quite, quite a, a set of accomplishments. And in, in going through the words entrepreneurship, small business, strategy, enterprise, they keep coming. So my first question to you, um, Professor David uh, Story, 
you know, you may, you may want to have a few words before you get going, but however did you come upon these themes and this field of work as the, 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 that, that which would define your career? Can you hear me, Indiana? Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Perfect. Thank you. Um, for those people listening, it is true that Indiana uh, and I had a, uh, an agreement prior to this that um, she would not do 10 minutes uh, of presentations on what I had done. So you can see that she is a totally untrustworthy person um, uh, in this regard. So uh, for those of you uh, who do want to know um, how I got into it, um, I suppose everything starts from school. Uh, and at school, uh, I was... Um, uh, by no means a good student. In fact, uh, I think I spent most of my time uh, bumping along the bottom of the classes that I was in. And uh, with hindsight, I attributed this um, to being not concerned with academic matters, but really being concerned with the big issues in life uh, for a UK teenager at that time. And those big issues was whether I was going to be the captain of the England cricket team uh, or whether I was going to be the captain of the England football team. These were the sorts of major choices I faced. Um, until at the age of 15, I was uh, playing football and I got a very serious knee injury. And uh, I was um, uh, put in plaster for six weeks. Uh, and essentially, my mother uh, wouldn't let me out of my room because my exams were coming up. Uh, and she kept me in the room. And therefore, I had six weeks of fairly intense supervision. And to the amazement of all concerned, um, uh, i.e., myself, uh, my family and particularly my teachers, uh, I managed to pass these exams. If you now fast forward uh, a further 15 years, uh, at this stage I'm at the age of 30. Uh, I have uh, fairly recently married and we have a, uh, a young, very young child. Uh, I have just completed my PhD in environmental economics. So I've done pretty well. Unfortunately, um, I have no job. And um, Mrs. Story was quite clear on this, that um, I was to go and get a job. Doesn't matter what the job is, just get a job. I was uh, lucky enough to see an advertisement uh, for a research fellow in what was called economic development. Now, having done a PhD in environmental economics, I haven't got a clue uh, what economic development meant. Um, but um, given my shortage of options and this combination of domestic pressure, um, I applied for the job. And I suspect because nobody else did, uh, I got the job. And therefore, I also think that none of my employers actually knew much about economic development either. So I had this carte blanche um, agenda, and it was to look at economic development in a far from prosperous part of Northeast England. And the context, a big picture context for that, is that Margaret Thatcher has only just uh, have been um, voted in as Prime Minister. And she wants to change Britain from what she perceives to be a, a dependency culture into what she calls an enterprise culture. So there is a huge focus at that time on enterprise 
being the solution uh, to the high levels of unemployment which the UK was experiencing. And the second bit of luck is that at that time, a very clever computer scientist in the United States called David Birch had sewed together um, the Dun and Bradstreet credit rating agency records for 5.6 million establishments in the United States and tracked them over a seven year period. And his conclusion was that two thirds of the increase in employment in the United States over those years came about because of new businesses and particularly businesses with less than 20 workers. And it was said at the time that if David Birch hadn't existed, then Margaret Thatcher would have invented it. Uh, and the influence of Birch was enormous. And my pal and I, who were in, engaged looking for something to do in economic development, we realized that actually for our area of Northern England, we had two censuses, one in 1965 and one in 1976, 11 years between them. And we thought we could do for Northeast England with perhaps 5,000 establishments, what Birch had done for the United States for 5.6 million. So ours was very much a, uh, a, a small scale cottage industry almost, but it took us a long time. And by the time we produced our pieces of work on how, how were the jobs created and how were the jobs lost in that area of Northeast England, we concluded that over that 11 year period, there were perhaps 1200 jobs created by new businesses. And on the day we presented our results, the British Steel Corporation closed the Britannia Steelworks in Middlesbrough. It closed and 4,000 people, 4,000 people lost their jobs. So this notion of Thatcher strutting the country, proclaiming enterprise as the solution to unemployment did not stack up to us and our results. And that, I suppose, has strongly influenced the research which I have done over many years. It is that enterprise is important. It should be encouraged and developed, but we should not make disproportionate claims for its overall impact. So, so, so that's, a, that's a very interesting perspective, David, because the, the, the term that springs to mind right now is the accidental academic. Um, many of us would have gone to school for years. Um, we would have gone through to graduate school, done PhDs and so on um, to actually become academics. But here you are. Um, having begun your journey, not out of plan or devisement, but as a means of necessity. Now, um, that last point you concluded on is very interesting um, about perception versus the reality and so on. And I want to take you to a, a, a very interesting question um, in, in the research world, in the world of um, uh, the academy, not just for business studies, but beyond. And that is the, the, the matter of methodologies and um, the, 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 the ideal or most appropriate methodology for studying SMEs and entrepreneurship. 
And I ask this because there is the ongoing debate about quantitative versus qualitative methods. And I know for many of my colleagues, for many students who may be on the platform watching, listening, this is something that we all have to justify, whether we're doing, um, academic, we're, we're doing um, graduate work research or we're intending to publish in a journal. So, so my question to you then is, what do you feel to be the most appropriate methodology for researching SMEs and entrepreneurship? Okay, let me begin by upsetting you and uh, no doubt several uh, other uh, people who are listening to this. Please fundamentally, do. <laughs> fundamentally, um, I, over the years, I have become increasingly convinced that the single most important and distinctive characteristic of a new and small firm is that it dies. SMEs are significantly more likely to die than larger enterprises. The smaller you are and the younger you are, the more likely it is that you're going to die. The problem I have with case studies is that with a couple of exceptions, perhaps, they only deal with live firms. Now, you're probably going to say to me, yes, but uh, lots of people who have started a business and restarted, they can become case studies. But you don't know how they're going to get on in the future. And what we know is that they are A, more likely to die, and B, that their performance is much more volatile. So in my view, if you are interested in economic outcomes, not, not satisfaction indicators, you first of all avoid any form of self-report data. You don't ask them because A, some of them don't know, B, a majority of them are optimists, and C, probably they try and persuade you that they're really doing very much better than you know they are. So the key issue to me is tracking it's cohorts, it's tracking groups of businesses to really see how they're getting on and the factors that explain it. I, I looked, let me just make a supplement on that, Indiana. Yes. I looked up what it was that the last time I came to Jamaica, and it was uh, on the 20th of, of January, uh, 2017, which I'm sure all of you know uh, is the day in which Donald Trump was uh, became president of the United States. Yes. And on that day, there was an absolutely brilliant article in the Gleaner. And I have used this article. And it says, why do we emphasize people's opinions? Because almost always the polls get it wrong in anything which is even close. So it said it got the Jamaican result wrong. It, 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 it got the British uh, Brexit result wrong. Yes. Uh, it even got the Canadian result wrong. And this is because you rely on self-report data and you can't do anything else other than have self-report data in case studies. So remember, I'm only focusing upon economic outcomes. I'm not focusing upon opinions, but if you're gonna do that, you have to track groups of representative firms 
over long periods of time. But, but, but then David, so, so let me interject at this point then. I'm sure I hear some of my colleagues, um, <laughs> even in the AIB community asking, okay, um, so what is the value of case studies? Certainly there must be some value to, to this methodology. Um, the the value of method uh, the value of a case study methodology, I think, um, is to do with a little bit better insights into how people who are running businesses think. What you can't do is believe what they are telling you, because they are optimists. They are out and out optimists. One thing, Indiana, have you have you got one of my? You, you've got a set of, of slides, I think. Uh, have you got them? Um, yes, I, I be, do. Let, let I me. Be, I do. Let me. I'll um, show you, I'll show you what I mean. Okay. Okay. Can I have? Uh, can I have the uh, fourth one down on the screen? Sorry, it's yeah, slide number four. Uh, next one down. Okay. Is That's this? It. Oh. The, the key issue is that everybody who deals um, in case studies will have immediately switched off when they see that slide. It, <laughs> it's, it appears to be almost unintelligible uh, to anybody, but it is, I think, the single most important slide to do with small new business performance. And I'll explain to you why it is. I ask those, for example, who teach entrepreneurship as to whether they ask the students to produce business plans. I ask business advisors about business plans. So they've got to bear in mind that this is a question about how reliable are business plans. And this, this slide shows that they exhibit almost no reliability. They are as close to fantasy as it's humanly possible to be. And I'll and explain so David, David, in that you are actually now making the work of us entrepreneurship um, lecturers very difficult with our students. But that's no, a very no, good isn't. point. It isn't. It, uh, we'll, we'll come back with positives later on. You, your question, understandably, was what's the merit of case studies? So let me show you this slide. This is. Uh, uh, based upon six and a half thousand businesses which start with a bank. And what they do is they track those businesses, the sales of them, every financial transaction made by those businesses are tracked. So it is 100% reliable unless the entrepreneur is putting the money under the bed. And what we see in the, on the, the, the bottom axis is we've stripped out all the businesses which don't get to year one. And we say, how, if you've got to year one, how fast did you grow to year two in terms of sales? And what you can see is that some of them have increased by 500 uh, percent, five uh, 500. Um, if you look at the other axis, you see those which grow in the, in the year two to three. And then you say to yourself, each one of those dots is a business. And what you can see is that there are some in the top right hand corner, there's one in the top right hand corner, which has grown uh, in, in year two to th year three, by 350%. And it also grew uh, by more than 400% in year one to two. But actually, if you look at the total picture, 
you find that of UK startups, only one third grew in both years. And in fact, even if they survived, 22% of them actually declined in both years. And the remainder grew either in one year or in uh, one year from year one to two or from year two to three. What does it mean for business plans? Have you ever seen a business plan which says, well, I'm probably going to survive, but I'm going to decline in both year two and year three? Have you ever seen one which even indicates that, that growth isn't continuous? Never. So watch people, Never. So watch people tell you and what actually happens are a long, long way from one another. Okay, so, so I, I think you, you've been, you've made a, a convincing argument here. And I know you say you'll come back later to the value of the case studies. But this, this is very interesting, David. And I think, uh, you know, just to, to, to highlight the benefit for us of having this conversation really it's it's not just um, it's not just about you um, and hearing about your career, but importantly, um, you, this is an opportunity for the um, Caribbean community of researchers, for the, those in Latin American community as well, to get this kind of insight into um, methodologies, into um, strategies for how to really produce more impactful research. Um, that that not only resides in the academic community, but also will can be used to inform business practices. So, so this is an, an, an excellent depiction. I, I'm just going to stop um, the sharing for now. And I, I'm sure once you're ready again, you can let me know and we'll come back to, to the slides. So, so this is a, a very important perspective that you've given because as a researcher myself, um, I have recognized the value of um, large sample sizes, but I found it difficult at times to get that. And so because uh, of the, 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 the process of examining specific issues to see how they work in our context, I have used case studies for, for, for that purpose. Um, but for sure, moving towards um, large, um, large cases, large number of cases is one of the things that we need to even in improving our research within the region. So in your bio, we went through a lot of the work that you've actually done in terms of um, guiding policy um, relating to entrepreneurship, small businesses, um, young people and across Europe and the world at large. So I want us to go there a little, David, to look at some of the interesting policy um, observations that you've uncovered during your work. And again, I, I think this is important to us as we think through what, what, what has been done already, what has been shown already, and then how can we then frame our research perspectives and research focus moving forward. And so a question I have, again, looking at small firms and your work there, do small firms contribute to jobs? Uh, and that, <laughs> that, that, that slide that you just showed was very interesting as well. So I want you to go a little more into that. And of course, some of this relates to the, the, the work that we did as well um, with Jonathan Lashley, who is also on the platform in that 2018 special issue on entrepreneurship and regional development. So I'd like you to address that point, David. For, for the Caribbean, of course, um, the dominant enterprise, it's, it's small firms. So do small firms create jobs? Okay. Um, the answer, of course, is it depends. Okay. So what does it depend upon? 
let me let me just uh, return then to my set of slides and um, can they go back up on the screen? Yes, they can definitely. You tell me which one you want me to go okay. to. No, the one under the one. Um, keep going. One more. That's it. Okay. No, that's not it. Okay. So I can I can go back. Yeah. Now you've gone too far. Okay. Right. Let's let's go forward on that one. All right. Forward on that one. And on this forward well. on that one. And finally, believe. forward on that one. Okay. So I believe this right. is the last slide. Yeah, well, pretty much. What I'm talking about are the firms which um, we have examined over a 10 year period. Uh, and they are totally new businesses. What we're interested in is not to how do individual firms get on, but how does the cohort get on? And to answer your question, do small, do let's say new firms create jobs? My best analogy is that it's like a leaky bath with so some of the water a lot of the water runs away so you keep putting water into this bath and much of it disappears down the plug hole so what does this tell table tell you it says that if we have this cohort of businesses six and a half thousand of them and we track them uh, over a 10 year period in the top left hand corner if you add up in year one what their sales were which is approximate for employment you see that they had sales that year of 630 million pounds if you roll your eyes down to the bottom of that column, you see that actually those firms have sales by the time we get to year 10 of only 282 million. So what happens? And the answer is, well, three things. The first is that you've got a group of firms who always get people's attention, who are those that are growing. You then got people's attention on firms which have declining sales. And then the ones nobody wants to talk about, which are the sales losses through exits. So you've got, you've got a plus, in the growing, you've got a minus in the declining, and you've got a minus in the sales loss. Now, what you can see then in, is that in the final column in red, you've got what actually the net effect is. So by the end of year one is our starting point. You haven't got any net change because that's, the, that's your baseline position. By the end of year two, I one year on, the sales of the cohort have actually fallen by 40, 41 million pounds. And it's primarily because of the exits. Almost all of that is down to the exits. You've got firms growing, 160, but you've got losses through exits. And what you can see from this is that 
over a period of time, the sales loss goes down. Sales loss um, from declining firms. And it, it also, you've got a fall in the sales loss through exits. So let's now look at year 10, the year 10 row. What you can see is that the actual contribution of firms in term, new firms in terms of sales has actually fallen from 630 to 282. So you say to yourself, I hope, well, this isn't what everyone else is telling me. And the answer is, look very closely when you see academic pieces of work about new ventures. Almost all of those new ventures are not new. So you get a very, very different picture if you actually started doing your calculations at year seven compared with year naught or year one. And almost all of the, in inverted commas, frequently cited pieces on job creation, the new firms are not new because they don't take account of exits. And as I said to you right from the start, exits are what defines being small and new. So do they create jobs? Yes, of course. If we, at the end of year 10, um, this group has sales of 282 million. That's a big number. But a lot of it has drained down the plug hole. And the solution, therefore, is to pour more water into the bath and to get more people to start businesses. That's where your job creation takes place. It does not happen within that cohort. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> so I think it's fair to say that this afternoon we're getting quite a bit of food for thought, um, which in, in many ways um, challenges some of the, 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 the received wisdom about the role of small businesses, their impact, and so on. And so given what you've just said, a question that I have for you then, um, what is the role of government in this case and government policy? Because we see where in the Caribbean, I'm sure in many other contexts in Latin America, that governments intervene to, 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 to help to create um, an environment for small businesses, to create policies, to, to feature, to encourage more startups and so on. And so my question to you, David, should governments be intervening in this way? The answer is unquestionably yes. Uh, it has to intervene. Um, there is no argument uh, uh, about that. But what it has to do is to be more careful, thoughtful, uh, and reflective based on evidence of assessing the impact of that intervention. Mm. So, for example, uh, the work you referred to, which um, uh, OECD is about to publish um, is uh, about policy impact evaluation. And yeah. crudely, if you asked me to summarize it, I would say the evidence, the reliable evidence, it is of impact of program, many programs of financial assistance. Where are I, uh, where the evidence is much, much weaker is on business, business support, referred to uh, as uh, information, advice, uh, assistance. Why is that? Why is the evidence weak? Because, again, you have to look at cohort. 
much. Yes. You can't just say, uh, oh, 85 percent of people who participated in this program thought it was a jolly good idea. That's not evaluation. Evaluation is being able to assert clearly that as a result of participating in this program, that businesses or those groups of businesses enhance their performance. So the metric is if it does not have a control group, it's not evaluation. You've got to have something which is a baseline comparison. And if you haven't got that, then you're kidding yourself. So the OECD results, or review, sorry, the OECD review will say there have been quite a lot of helpful reviews of finance uh, demonstrating impact. The jury is very much still out on other forms of business support. Yes, yes, quite indeed. Uh, I, sorry, I, let, me, let me just make one other thing. I could see you Please nodding do. there. Um, the, the other thing I was going to say is that when we talk about policy, what the influences um, of policy or SME policy are not just on SMEs. SMEs are influenced by a range of other policies. And I remember as part of our um, special issue, I remember that uh, one of Jonathan's pieces talked about, for example, um, the role of the police service. That, that is a, a potentially major barrier to the uh, evolution of a, of a vibrant uh, set of SMEs, but it's never thought of as SME policy. Transport, reliability of infrastructure, these are things which are hugely influential to the SME sector, upon the SME sector, and it's those things as well as targeted SME policy which we need to look at fantastic fantastic because um we, we we often talk about things in silos and not understanding that there's an entire ecosystem which has to be there to facilitate the functioning of, of these entities so so let me ask you then david um there, there's a a, a lot of policies and initiatives over the last couple of years um, to, to encourage entrepreneurship, um, to facilitate startups. And one of the emerging discussions, certainly from the, the Caribbean and Latin American perspective is, you know, what should the emphasis be on encouraging startups generally, or should there be more of an emphasis on encouraging high growth firms? Should the focus be on just startups or actually on high growth firms? And that's a question I pose to you. Yes, um, I'm very familiar with the question. Um, and uh, I don't think it is an either or. Uh, the answer is that you do need both elements. So let me come back to my point. What I believe is important is the creation of an environment in which SMEs can thrive. That can be partly because of explicit SME policy, loans, for example, uh, but I don't think there's evidence uh, of other forms of support being very effective. I think it's vitally important that the SME agenda is placed in a wider governmental agenda. So it's roads, it's crime, it's infrastructure. It, so that it has to play an element. So it's again, 
to do with the macro picture. The problem with small firms is that we know uh, from many years experience that a disproportionate number uh, of or disproportionate proportion of the jobs occur in a tiny proportion of firms. Therefore, there is an inevitable tendency to say, well, why don't we focus upon those, those types of firms? And increasingly, uh, I have moved away to a more skeptical point of view based on evidence in a number of countries. And it is that identifying those growth firms is almost impossible. It's very, very difficult to be confident that you can identify a firm with growth potential at an individual, dare I say it, case study level. One of the things which comes out is that many of the businesses which have periods of growth then have periods of decline. It isn't true that growth is always higher uh, amongst firms uh, that um, have exhibited it in the past. If anything, well, there are many instances, let's say, of firms which have grown rapidly over two or three years and then descend. So picking winners is a really, really problematic area. And dare I say, this is where I introduce a, a technical term. Essentially, what I have concluded is that the best model for explaining the performance uh, of new and small firms is something called gambler's ruin. In other words, it says you take a risk when you go into uh, the casino. It, you will win or you will lose. Most times you lose because there are very few bankrupt casino owners. So the chances are you're not going to win. But predicting exactly what is going to happen to you on that route is extremely difficult, which is why we come back to avoiding case studies. What we have to do is to focus upon large numbers of the, create the environment in which you have significant numbers of businesses rather than uh, a focus exclusively on, on winner picking. It's very attractive. I was involved in it myself, but I just could no longer recommend it as a policy strategy. Okay, so, so, so that's interesting and, and very interesting policy directions too, um, policy advice for, for, for our policymakers. And I'm wondering then, David, I mean, we, we did, the, the special issue um, in entrepreneurship and regional development that looked at um, entrepreneurship and development in the Caribbean, in which we featured a number of our colleagues from within the region and the diaspora. And, and one of the points that we concluded on, which meshes a little with my area of research in the diaspora as well, um, and, and oftentimes we hear of the importance of the diaspora for the Caribbean small countries and so on. What role do you think uh, the diaspora can play in, 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 in entrepreneurship, um, SME development? And this is both from a practical policy, um, managerial perspective, as well as uh, in research. Okay. Um, you're probably better A, to answer it yourself, uh, and B, to get Jonathan to answer it on my behalf. But I was very taken uh, with um, uh, this diaspora argument. Uh, it, in essence, what is required 
uh, to almost get entrepreneurship off the ground at the micro level are significant role models. Yes. Um, and those role models are frequently created by individuals uh, who have left the Caribbean, uh, but still have a continuing commitment to the Caribbean, uh, both uh, financial uh, and emotional. And they, they could really uh, play a very powerful role um, in stimulating and encouraging um, uh, individuals who are still within the Caribbean uh, to uh, start businesses and, and pursue businesses, even when inevitably these things are tough going. Uh, I'm, uh, one of the things I think I, I persuaded you and Jonathan, I, I slotted in a sentence um, uh, in, the, in the review, which probably um, sneaked past your editorial guidance. And I said, universities have a very powerful role to play in this. You could be the honest broker uh, in, in ensuring uh, that the individual who has been successful in North America or, or in Europe um, is uh, brought back to the Caribbean, honored by a university uh, and expected to, to, by implication, to play a role in this um, stimulation uh, of entrepreneurial activity in the island. Thank you very much, David. And, and one of my colleagues has just put a link um, for that special issue in entrepreneurship and regional development in the chat. I, I also have questions coming to me directly. So I'm going to ask my colleagues just to put the, the, the questions um, for the benefit of everyone as well. So we, we, we're winding down before we get into um, the, the, the general Q&A, David. And I wanted to ask because we, we brought you here to talk to us um, in the Caribbean and Latin America. And I'm looking at the persons who are on, I, I'm not able to tell those who are on um, Facebook, but for those of us on, on, on the Zoom platform, I see a number of colleagues from the different campuses across the region. I see a number of colleagues from the Latin American region. I also see um, Georgie, who is the chair of AIB LAC. Welcome, Georgie. Um, and so let me pose then to you, David. So one of the last points I mentioned in the introduction was the fact that you had in fact, um, you have done research in Jamaica, in, in Mexico, in, in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, among the, the many publications that you have, it, it is one, um, with Khan, um, Yoshinori Khan, and that features a theory of discouraged borrowers. And of course, this publication accounts for over 500 of your over 31,000 citations. And so I wanted you within that context to speak to the significance of this paper, the significance of this research, as a, as a way of introducing us to your actual research in the region uh, and some of your, your most significant observations. Thank you. Um, for those of you listening, um, uh, Anna and I uh, have dis discussed this issue um, and I'm hesitant uh, to tell you uh, my discouraged borrower's story but I will tell you um, that uh, it emerged from a, a piece of work uh, which I was involved in, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. It was uh, the first ever survey of micro enterprises uh, in those islands. Um, and it was conducted probably 20 years ago. And uh, it was, I suppose, fairly standard in its findings uh, except in one respect. And it, one thing which really surprised us was we asked businesses, uh, these are micro enterprises, I mean, truly micro enterprises. Um, we asked them about whether uh, they had approached the banks for access to finance. And 
we were surprised that very, very few of them had. And then we asked those who did approach the banks, were they successful or not? And we found that 80% of businesses who had applied to the banks were actually successful. And when we, when we took this round to uh, organizations within Trinidad, they didn't believe us. They said, that can't be right. 80% of applicants get the money. No, 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 you've got the wrong country. And we said, no, no, this is, this, is what, uh, this is what we get. And so we thought about the two statistics and we realized that actually a, probably a substantial proportion of people who didn't apply might well have been successful if they had. And we coined the term discouraged borrowers. So when the um, piece of work was completed, um, it generated a little bit of interest. And about 18 months later, I, I went back to Trinidad and I'm coming in uh, from, from the uh, uh, airport and uh, the taxi, I'm in the taxi. And of course, there's enormous heat in the, in the country. Uh, the windows are open, the music is blaring, and I am totally jet lagged. Uh, and I'm just trying to pluck up courage to, tear, to get the taxi driver to turn the radio off. And it says, uh, it's an advertisement. And it says, do you run a business? If you do, apply to us. 80% of people who applied were successful. Research has shown that. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm completely wasting my time. But this notion of exactly who was discouraged and why they were discouraged then starts having applications outside TNT because the types of people who were discouraged were often people of low literacy. They didn't want to apply. They're also a group of people um, who don't want to tell anybody about what's going on. But fundamentally, they're a group of people who just don't have the confidence to apply and incur all of the costs, both financial uh, of putting it together, the emotional costs of rejection. All of those things are hugely important. And uh, Yoshi Khan and I uh, wrote, wrote this piece and uh, it's now been applied in a large number of, of other countries in different contexts. So uh, a lot of it is concerned with issues relating to gender. You know, is, is there evidence that females are, are more uh, likely to be discouraged than males? How much is it due to the availability of information in the economy? So these are, uh, th this is an example, my, my best example of having a, an impact and it's also for the academics listening, it's an illustration of how an empirical fact can be converted into a theoretical paper. Fantastic. And, and I, I won't share the, the other part of that story that we discussed, David, but um, I'm certainly um, this kind of research, you know, as you mentioned, it, it not only has an academic impact, but a direct policy impact for how our banking institutions um, approach and support SMEs, and even to the, the, the incubators, the agencies that have been established to foster um, SME development, this kind of information is, is essential. And that's a point that we also made in the special issue, which is that it's not just good enough to create the packages for SMEs. You, you literally, having created them, you need to know, engage, and hold their hands through the application process 
because many are daunted or, or find the process of, of um, applying for funding to be very daunting. It, it exposes them. Uh, and even when we think about research and business, the, the softer side um, that we tend to ignore sometimes, they also play, play a role. And so I, 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 a question that you wanted to say something, David? No. Okay. And so um, where my, my question then is, how has this research um, kind of shaped your perspective and, and what you've done? But also, um, when you look at your findings, the research that you've conducted and so on, you know, uh, I'm trying to find the best way to frame this. How does this work really? Can, can it assist us um, as groups of researchers across the region in terms of informing us um, what is interesting to look at? Um, what are the, the, the research questions that have yet to be answered but that still need to be interrogated? The first thing is that um, you have to say it's it's important uh, to I think uh, liaise with international organisations. Uh, the World Bank, for example, uh, has been very influential in policy development because it has access to good data and good surveys. Um, and I think if I were uh, uh, if I were you personally, I think I would be uh, finding ways uh, to liaise much more closely uh, with organizations such as the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, um, and other international organizations to uh, set up um, long-standing cohorts of businesses which you can monitor and track over a long period of time. It is not a quick fix. It is a very long fix. But you, this is a case of you having to play the long game. Yes. And it isn't good enough, I don't yes. think, to, to believe that you can sew together a series of snapshots all of which are done by different people at different periods of time uh, because there is a lack of continuity, a lack of leadership inevitably in that type of approach. So my first recommendation would be um, for the University of the West Indies to put you on a plane to Washington for you to go and talk to the World Bank. <laughs> Thank you for that recommendation, and I do hope the University of the West Indies will in fact do that, David. But, but I mean, I, I, I laugh, but it's a very, very serious issue because um, one of the, the limitations I find for myself, and I have other colleagues in the Latin American region as well, and it is actually getting that funding support to do that kind of um, a, a, a long frame study to really develop or, or, or identify patterns. Um, and, and this is one of the areas, or one of the reasons why I think there's still such a gray space in terms of knowledge of the Caribbean and Latin American experience in business and in entrepreneurship. We're, we're working to close that gap, but for sure the funding to allow um, why that kind of study is missing. So I, I'm hoping, um, Yes, that I will be put on that plane, David. Um, so as, as I, I, I've gotten some questions in the chat, so I'm going to, 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 to pause my questions, David, and so I'm going to allow the rest of the community here um, to actually ask the questions. I'm going to begin, so feel free, colleagues on the, the platform, um, you can raise your hand, if you have a comment or question that you want to make. Um, I also have some questions that have been sent to me in the chat, David. So I'll begin 
with those. I don't know if any of the um, persons joining us on Facebook have questions. Also, please feel free to, to send them in the chat there. So, so Jonathan um, had sent an apology earlier. But David, I have a, a couple of questions. So the first, and I, of course, thank you colleagues for sending through your questions. So it is, um, thank you very much for your very insightful remarks. I'm reading the, the question. And so a question is, what weight does the luck factor has on firm survival and growth? A, a very well, interesting one to get you going. It's both interesting uh, and uh, something I have um, uh, thought about uh, over many years. And I've become increasingly convinced that it is a major component. Um, uh, I, I often think of the analogy of uh, the small business owner uh, as um, being on a surfboard. Um, uh, things are out of their control most of the time. They can be uh, swept to one side or swept to the other. The skill is surviving the sweeping. But who is going to be able to do that and who is not is much more difficult to predict. The only thing uh, I would reassure uh, anybody who is listening is about the importance of, in a new business of essentially cash. Cash is, and liquidity is the key skill which enables business, new businesses to survive. And that is abundantly clear uh, from our examination uh, of Barclays businesses. Access to cash whether it is from the bank in terms of a loan and the management of that cash is absolutely crucial. I would say after luck, and luck is number one, closely followed by have, have you got the skills to manage the cash? Because money doesn't come in consistently. It comes in periodically and unpredictably. So you've, you've got to have a cash cushion in order to be able to survive the unexpected. To you, the only thing you know about the unexpected is that it's coming. Yes. yes. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So um, I'm going to uh, um, focus on Michael Noel's question before I move to the others. And it is, how do you suggest as a method to ascertain, uh, Michael, I'm going through, I'm not sure, but I'll read it. But Michael, please feel free to open your mic and ask your question. Um, so it is, how do you suggest as a method to ascertain the true impact of previous failure upon current business success. Michael, that sounds like a, a thesis question. Is this your research question that you're getting Prof Story to answer? Well, it is my area of research. And um, oh, the question is that previous, we don't take into account people who have started businesses and failed. They don't show up because if you go to registered businesses, okay, th those are successful. But as was pointed out, it takes a year or two and longitudinal studies have suggested that you really are able to monitor how a business is. But some have started and dropped out. Some reappear, some don't. So how do we get a true sense of how many businesses really fail? And those businesses that fail, how do they re-emerge as new businesses? Because I mean, that is all about entrepreneurship. Eh? the ability to fail and get back up again. And um, it is challenging doing that type of research if it is not a longitudinal research project. You have a short time, you have entrepreneurs to look at, but they don't tell you, they don't admit failure. How do you address that? Okay, can I, can I respond, Indiana? 
Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Fundamentally, there is the issue of learning. Pre people who have previously failed in business are often argued to have learned from that experience and therefore run a business next time round, which is one that didn't make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, several countries uh, have introduced programs to enable previously failed business owners to more easily enter entrepreneurship. I believe the evidence supporting learning in this case is very weak indeed. The evidence in inverted commas is often based upon the United States. Instances of people who subsequently became extremely successful, but who previously failed in business. And the classic example is Walt Disney. But Indiana, this is back to case studies. What it doesn't tell you is all the people who tried again and made either the same or different mistakes. So you have got to track a cohort of people, some of whom have been in business before, some of whom haven't, and to see whether performance after startup differs between the two. In our Barclays case, we find it makes no difference at all if you have previously owned a business to your current and future business performance. We can track that. Indeed, in Germany, which is again probably an extreme example, there's just a piece currently in small business economics in which they show that in an individual who was previously bankrupt actually is less likely to succeed next time round. And the easy inference for that is because they weren't able to get the money uh, to run the business. The, the access to cash was, so, was, was cut off. What I'm saying to you is you have got to, got to, got to have a tracking mechanism. You cannot ask an individual who, is, who previously failed in business and is now running a business about whether they thought they had learned from that experience. That's not good research. It's very typical, but it is not good research. Thank you very much for, for, for that um, response. So I hope that that's been useful and that will prove useful for you as well. So yes. there, 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 there are two questions that have come in that I'll, I'll put together. So I see um, a question from um, David McBean, our executive director. Can entrepreneurship be taught or is it an innate attribute that can be nurtured and allowed to blossom? Uh, I'll stop there and then tie that in with a, another question that has come through. And that question is, do business school programs prepare future responsible entrepreneurs, or do we need to change the way we teach entrepreneurship? You, you can let me know if you can take those two together, David, or if you want to um, separate them. Let, let me do the easy, uh, the easy one first. Okay. Can entrepreneurship be taught? Uh, my view on that is that there is a value in uh, making students aware of the entrepreneurial option. When I was uh, considering careers, the only career which was sensible was either government, academia, or, the, or, or large enterprises. The, the notion of starting your own business was, was never even considered. So it is very important for it to be part of the menu of choices 
that are laid before the student community. But there's a difference between a menu of choices and implying that if you do this, you will be successful. If you look at the courses on entrepreneurship that are taught throughout the world, they don't have, for example, 25% um, of the guest speakers being bankrupts. They don't have uh, uh, a, another 25% whose businesses had always bumped along the bottom. They had all sorts of stresses and strains. Their marriages are broken down. They don't get the people who run these courses are, are essentially seeking to market entrepreneurship. That's not what it's about. I think it is about making people aware realistically of the entrepreneurial option. And that option has its pluses and minuses. And only you as the individual can ultimately make up your mind if it's a path you want to go along. What you can't be what you can't do is to sell it uh, and success being X percent of students actually went out and started their business. That's not the criteria. And so I was about to add to that, um, going back to your discussion about the need for longitudinal studies and, and multiple cases, this is where we, we are, could then conduct the research to make a, a, um, what, an argument one way or the other about the value of entrepreneurship education, because this is a topic exactly as posed that I have with my students, a discussion with my students every single semester. But if you're going to do that, uh, you've got to have a control group. Yes. You can't just look at the people who went on the course. Yes. You actually, you could, you could run one of these much loved by academics, but much hated by policymakers, randomized control trials. So what you have is you have a hundred students who want to go on your course, Indiana. What you do is you say half of you will come on the course and half of you will not. And then you track what happens to the ones who went on the course and you track the ones who didn't go on the course. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why it's a nice randomized controlled trials is that they were both motivated to start a business. Otherwise, they wouldn't have applied. So you track both groups over a period of time and the evidence which I have seen suggests that many of them who came on your course actually become much more credible to large businesses because you teach them skills which actually are very attractive to large businesses. So they don't actually be less likely to go into business simply because they are more skilled. Mm -hmm. And that's, my, that's one of my suspicions as well, David. And in fact, just listening to you, I've gotten my, my approach to how I'm going to do that particular study. So, so take one achievement already from this session. So there is, uh, um, for those who are on Facebook, there is a ongoing discussion in the chat um, about this issue of luck. Um, and so the second part of um, David McBean's question was, is luck not when preparation meets opportunity? And then I see where Michael Marshall, who is joining us from Scotland, is um, wants us to return to the, the, the luck issue. And he's um, asking, is the luck factor not just the unknowns that we haven't explained, if so, is it worthwhile or have you considered unpacking this luck factor? And, and finally, Michael Noel is responding, the comparison of entrepreneurs to gamblers is apt, but luck also requires knowing when to leave the casino 
which some authors have, <laughs> have attributed to the principle of affordable loss. So I don't know if you have okay. any additional perspective on those, Prof. How many hours have you got? <laughs> and we're, on, we're, we're coming up to the time as well. But nonetheless, please give it your best shot. Okay, my best shot. Um, the first is that Tiger Woods apparently said, isn't it strange how the more I practice, the luckier I get? <laughs> and that is often used as a justification for almost putting luck to one side. My, my analogy for what is called gambler's ruin is the individual entrepreneur or the individual gambler is entering the casino. What influences whether they survive in the casino is, first of all, how many chips they buy. So the more, the more chips they buy, the more rounds of bad luck they can experience without having to go home with their head between their legs, dispirited. So the first thing is survival depends upon access to cash in a, in a business. That's the number one issue. The number, number two issue is that different people, of course, have different access to cash. So it might be that an individual uh, can only have his own money, but the individual may also uh, be able to access somebody else's money. So let's again go back and observe what happens in businesses. You remember my splatter diagram, which, are, which we got up, and we showed that some of those businesses grew incredibly quickly in in one of the two years. And if they go to the bank at that point, the bank might be tempted, and isn't very often, but might be tempted to believe that it's going to be an incredibly successful business because it will go on being a successful. And this is what venture capitalists say, look for some element of track record. What venture capitalists will not let you near as a researcher are the applications that it receives and the judgments that it makes. So if there is a venture capitalist out there uh, who wants to look at the effectiveness of the support they have got to get out all of their applicants see which ones they choose and track both the successful and the unsuccessful ones. So luck has an enormous role to play. It is the single most important thing after access to funding. And this is hugely disappointing if you are somebody who, who doesn't believe in chance. You believe that the entrepreneur has the power to influence events. Not that he's actually not a surfboarder, but actually the captain of an oil tanker who can go through all these waves without any problem at all. Mm. My, my experience, my data tells me that that is not the case. And the smaller you are and the younger you are, the more you're gonna get buffeted about. And that I capture in the phrase, in the word luck. Ah, thank you so much. So I know we, we are both out of time um, and I see some other questions. So what we'll do is probably try to capture those questions and pose them to you afterwards, David. But there's, there's one question that's come from one of our, 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 our visitors to the platform. And this is from um, George Saridakis. Uh, and, and so George is asking, you, you just meant, well, the last point you just made kind of speaks to um, the, 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 the 
typical, the characteristics of entrepreneurs uh, and motivation. And so George's question, do we know much about entrepreneurs characteristics? Example, measured risk-taking, creative self-efficacy, commercial awareness, or have some of these aspects been overemphasized in the literature? Okay. Um, uh, George has got to uh, uh, acknowledge that he has been the misfortune to be one of my co-authors over a number of years. Um, so um, uh, he's taught me an awful lot. I may have, I may have taught him something. Entrepreneur characteristics are almost always analyzed um, uh, in a manner which I would regard as unsatisfactory. So uh, if you look at entrepreneurial orientation, people are asked very often, uh, the bit, runners, owners of businesses are asked about a whole series of entrepreneurial orientation questions. And then they are linked to the performance of that business. Now, first thing you should have picked up, everyone should have picked up is today's performance is no guide to tomorrow's performance. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there is a great reluctance to do them on tracking over periods of time. So what we should be doing is we should observe entrepreneurial orientation characteristics at period T, and then we track the business over T plus one to T plus 10. And this is true for almost all the other entrepreneurial characteristics. One of the things you, you, uh, you will know about is ecosystems. There's a lot of discussion about ecosystems. Uh, and again, this is correlation without causation. We observe that geographical areas which are successful have the following characteristics. That is correlation. What we don't observe is that if we observe that there were changes in these characteristics, which led to changes in economic performance, we might be a little bit more persuaded. But if you look geographically at what happens, the geographical areas, certainly in the UK, in Germany, and in the United States, which were poor performers 50 years ago, continue to be poor performers today. So Correlation is not causation, and the reluctance to engage in, dis, in ha having data sets which address that is a real, real problem, uh, I think, for the credibility of entrepreneurship research more widely. Thank you so much, David. And so I, I, I must aware fully that you are now deeply into the night hours in the UK. Um, and, and, and I don't want to keep you from Mrs. Story much longer. Um, and so this really leaves me, I know um, there may be other questions and I see a question from my colleague as well, Trevor Smith, that we will um, try to address otherwise. Um, just leaves me to really thank you, Professor David Story just listening uh, and for those of us who, who are here, um, I'm sure we'd have benefited from hearing um, about research perspectives, methodologies, um, outstanding questions and issues that remain to be addressed. Um, and even the, the contribution that research in the Latin American and Caribbean region um, can make in fact, I see my colleague um, Craig saying a full meal, and indeed it has. So for those of us who are research students, those who are academics, we've been given, um, thank you, David, we will move along with your ideas, a rich menu 
of topics that we can in fact research. And the, the, the benefit of having your perspective as well is that following some of these will get us into some of the top journals, right? Um, <laughs> so thank you so much, Professor David Story. Um, I, I know I've been gushing and so on, but all of this is from my respect, my admiration for your work. And I know for the most part, we've talked about your scholarly work, but you are also an excellent mentor. Um, you're willing to, to talk with young academics. You're willing to partner in researching and, and publishing with young academics. And, and that is fantastic. It's something to be commended. And so the body of work that you leave behind and, and this 30, over 34,000 citations, right? It, it will keep growing because you've invested in, in, in reaching out to the next generation of, of, of scholars and researchers. And so I encourage all of my colleagues here on the platform to really take these ideas. Um, David has mentioned the benefit of collaborative work. So I'm also encouraging you to reach out to others on the platform here to start research, whether it be research um, involving multiple Caribbean countries, research involving the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, and indeed, that is one way of expanding our reach and impact um, as we move forward in, 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 along the research journey. So thank you very much, Professor David Story, for joining us. I want to thank all of our guests um, both on the Zoom platform and on, on Facebook. Thank you for your, your questions. Um, thank you for your attention. You have been an attentive audience. Um, thank you also to our partners in the AIB LAC community. Thank you, Georgie, um, who's, who's chair of um, AIB LAC, who's online. Georgie, I don't know if you want to make any quick comments before we close. Just thank you, everyone. Thank you, Indiana, for the brilliant uh, uh, leading of this uh, this discussion. And Professor David's story, where I don't have words to say how thankful I am and how you know how much I wish I would have learned because you talked so much and I, I how ignorant I was, right? And I still am, but really, really, it enlightened me. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Georgie. And of course, thanks to Diana Weinberg, who, who really helped me from the AIB LAC family to get the session together. Thank you to all of our, our audience who joined us from all over the world, I see. Um, and I encourage you as well to visit the AIB LAC website. So our conference is going to be in Miami in July, July 5 to 6. We're inviting you to come along. We're also inviting those among you who are students, graduate students, to actually apply for um, participation in the graduate consortium. The deadline for applications is actually March 15, and it's a, a 1500 word um, abstract that you would need to submit for your research. Again, visit the website for guidelines. And we also encourage you to um, get to know a little more about us at the Mona School of Business and Management. Visit our website or suite of programs. We're always interested as well in getting um, uh, international colleagues involved in our classroom. And thanks to COVID has been bad, but it's allowed us to really get more of an international flavor and input in our teaching. So if you're interested in being guest lecturers in our programs, please reach out to us. Um, and also, you know, I don't want to forget my colleagues here who, who have helped me from the research committee, uh, Ms. Christina Hossein. Christina, I'm going to ask you to put in the chat once more the, the links to the special issues um, that we've worked on with Professor David Story. One, of course, is in entrepreneurship and regional development. Um, we, I, I, I sometimes say we pulled a coup in being able to get this um, highly rated journal to agree to do a special issue on the Caribbean. It's never done that before. And so we're able to feature a number of our colleagues across all the campuses in that special issue. And of course, our own journal, Social and Economic Studies, Professor Story also contributed a short article in that special issue as well. And so the, the, the room is ripe 
for collaboration and engagement. There is a lot of work to be done among us researchers in the Latin American Caribbean region as has been highlighted in, in the presentation. Thanks to, um, to the other members on the, the research committee, Mr. Craig Peru, uh, Ms. Ms. Benny Watson, Benny Tetch Watson, so we all say Benny for short and to the other members of the support team IT. Thanks um, Dr. David McBean for um, facilitating us doing this event. And so without further ado, I want to bid you all a wonderful afternoon and please go ahead, make use of all the information, all the research tips that you've gotten from this session. Thank you very much, take care. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, David. I forgot to mention as well. So we will, in fact, um, some of us will stay on. We will have a, a, a MSBM meeting that comes in shortly after this. But the rest of you are free to go. And David, I will reach out separately. Thank you so very much. Super, I really enjoyed it. And it's as ever a delight to speak to you. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> Take care, all the best. Dr. McBean, I don't know if you had any. No, thank you, Professor Story. And um, for background, I'm involved in some of these entrepreneurship committees at the national level. So if it's okay, I would like to reach out to you um, informally at some other point because it, it, your, your talk has been stimulating in challenging many of the notions that go into policy development. Uh, for sure. Um, expend, uh, expenditure prioritization. So thank you very much. Be happy to help. Thank you. And, and so you're free now, David, to, to, to shut up your camera and say goodbye to all of us. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>